Good morning, everybody. My name is Trish O'Shaughnessy. I'm the postgraduate program manager here in Cork University Business School in UCC. I'd first like to welcome everybody this morning who's participating in this webinar. This is our second webinar in a series of webinars. Our next webinar will take place on the 20th of May at 12 p.m. And the title of that webinar will be Creating Digital Services That People Actually Need and Want. So I'm first going to give you an overview of what will happen today at the webinar. Um, we will have three different speakers. Our first speaker will be Dr. Nick Chisholm. Nick is the Programme Director of the MSC Food Security Policy and Management, followed by Dr. Noreen Byrne and Dr. Oliver Moore, who are the Programme Directors for the MSC Cooperatives, Agri-Food and Sustainable Development. Uh, finally, we'll have Dr. Ronan O'Farrell, who is the Programme Director of the MSC in Food Business and Innovation. So anytime throughout the presentation, if you want to ask questions, you're more than welcome to put your questions on the YouTube channel. We will have people moderating those questions and all three Programme Directors and myself will also be available for questions after the webinar. So to kick everything off, I'd like to first introduce Dr. Nick Chisholm, who is the Programme Director of the MSC Food Security Policy and Management. So, hello, Nick, would you like to get... Hi, Trish. Um, so, thank you very much for um, introducing me. So, um, as, as Trish said, uh, my name is Nick Chisholm. I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Business and Development, and I am the program director of the MSC Food Security Policy and Management. So, um, I'm going to say a few words about um, the impact of COVID-19 on food security, particularly in developing countries. Um, food security is a global issue. It's really around um, ensuring that everybody has access to enough food, both in terms of quantity and quality, um, to meet their to meet their needs. So it's it's very much a global issue. Um, in the case of the food security um, masters program, we focus on these global dimensions, but we probably particularly uh, have a have a particular focus on. Um, developing countries and, and the issues in developing countries. And I suppose um, what we're aiming to um, look at in the master's program is how to achieve food security for all and how to bring about um, resilient and sustainable food systems. So um, moving on to the, the, the first slide then, you can see the, a diagram there, which is a sort of conceptual framework um, explaining what a food system is. So a food system essentially is um, all those elements that um, link the production of food to the consumption of food. Um, you can see sort of pictures of, of two women involved in agricultural production in developing countries there. Um, there are many diverse agricultural systems that produce food um, across the world, but the production of food is only part of the food system. So um, once food is produced, it has to be um, marketed, it has to be processed, it has to be got to retail, and then ultimately it gets to the consumer. Um, and I suppose in, in that diagram, uh, it's looking at the links between dietary quality and food systems. So we're not just talking about um, any type of food. We're, we're really interested in how the food system can contribute to dietary quality and good nutrition. And of course, these days, there are also other considerations to take into account uh, in terms of food systems um, around sustainability because of the whole climate crisis um, and also other issues. So um, I'm going to um, move on to talk more specifically about um, the impacts of COVID-19 on developing countries. Um, okay. Um, okay, I'm having some difficulty transitioning to the next slide. Um, sorry, I'm having some problem here um, transitioning to the next slide. Uh, 
Hi, we oh, might move on to you, Nick. So um, we might move on to Noreen and Dr. Oliver Moore, who will be talking about the MSB and cooperatives. Um, agri-food and sustainable development and the impact of COVID-19. So Noreen and Oliver. Hi, yeah. Hi Oliver. Hi, Hi Trish. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks Trish and uh, thank you everybody for tuning in today. Uh, my name is Noreen Byrne and I'm the co-director of the MSc in Cooperatives, Agri-Food and Sustainable Development. And I suppose the, um, the relevance of the programme has come into sharp uh, focus in uh, during the COVID-19 um, uh, crisis. Um, we will come back to a uh, discussion of the programme uh, later on. Uh, at the end of the uh, talk, um, but today we're going to talk about uh, food systems, um, the responses uh, uh, to COVID-19. And um, I'm presenting with uh, Oliver Moore and uh, Oliver is just going to give a brief introduction to himself. Hi, yeah, I'm Oliver Moore. I lecture on the sharing economy and on the social and solidarity economy and also a little bit on EU agri-food policy. Okay, thanks, Ali. So we just, yeah. So I suppose in relation to COVID-19, uh, it has exposed the issues in the uh, food system. And I've just taken, um, I suppose, three relatively uh, conservative sources. And uh, they seem to be in line with, uh, I suppose, the critique over the last number of years on the food system. Um, so the first one, their food issues, uh, social and environmental impacts are now, due to COVID-19, in full glare of uh, public attention. It has become more urgent than ever for society to rethink the future of uh, food. So I suppose the kind of um, cover has been uh, whipped off and uh, the flaws are, are fully uh, visible. Uh, COVID-19 has uh, highlighted the risk of globalised food, uh, food availability will no longer be taken for granted and that's from KMPG, the first one there is from Delight. And the last one then from Time Magazine, need to design a whole new regional food system that can withstand uh, these um, shocks. So I suppose this consensus that there is uh, issues with the food system and it's time for uh, change. So I suppose the other thing in relation to COVID-19, it's shown that change is possible and there's a very clear shifting mindsets and behaviours. Um, I suppose within the farming sector, there's a renewed recognition of the importance of, of primary production. That's kind of come out to the fore uh, again. Um, consumers uh, questioning um, where our food is coming from. Um, you know, in relation, a lot of people are baking and all of that, and uh, maybe realizing for the first time ever that a lot of the flour, uh, you know, is import. Most of it is imported in, and um, seeing the farmer maybe in a different light, or seeing the farmer maybe for the first uh, first time really, uh, cooking from scratch, um, a lot of upskilling, and for uh, being has suggested that a lot of those um, skills, a lot of those habits are going to stick after the uh, crisis when it eventually uh, passes. And uh, they draw on research which shows that it takes 66 days to change a habit. Um, so they feel, uh, I suppose, with the length of the lockdown and uh, all of that um, uh, activity in relation to uh, <clears throat> home cooking. And I suppose with the food industry, I suppose it's very much uh, countering that because over the last number of years, it's been the opposite, a lot of de-skilling. Um, the other, um, I suppose, aspect is uh, local and regional supply chains. Uh, shopping local now just makes sense. Um, so people looking around their, their local area, what can I buy locally? Um, supermarkets also with local supply chains have done much better. Uh, for example, Supervalue has edged to uh, forward to number one 
and um, because it has a greater diversity and uh, is more inclined to use uh, local supply chains. I suppose the alternatives have moved into the mainstream. It's now uh, something that just makes sense. It's not a kind of an identity thing or anything. It's just a practical, makes sense um, um, aspect to it. So I'll just pass you over to Ali now. I yeah, I, so um, I guess in this new context, we've seen um, we've seen cooperation really come to the fore. Uh, instantly, instinctively, um, people have reached out to each other, which has been very heartening. Uh, so you've seen like street level WhatsApp groups of mutual support where people are checking in on their neighbors and shopping for their neighbors for the first time. Um, and from that street level all the way up to the EU institutions, we've seen um, a sense of solidarity, a sense of mutual aid, a sense of sharing. Um, so we've seen cooperative and collaborative responses, um, even from, like, say, the bingo callouts and the flats in Dublin, all the way up to um, fiscal rules being um, adjusted radically at the EU level to allow countries to do what was necessary to keep the agri-food system going and to keep the basics the basic food, shelter, medicine uh, functioning in Europe. Uh, Co-ops themselves as organizations have done lots to encourage and help their members um, in this context, even like the dairy co-ops in, um, in West Cork, for example, paid out an extra dividend to their members uh, rather than losing money in the context of supply chains being disrupted. We've seen an imaginative response as well. Amsterdam as a city has brought in the, the K. Rawert's idea of donut economics, which integrates um, planetary boundaries and socioeconomic needs into one conceptual framework. Um, so they're now trying to plan Amsterdam in that context. Spain is looking at bringing in a new universal basic income. And these are the kind of things that just were inconceivable um, five years ago, even two years ago, even six months ago. So we've seen an instinctive response of cooperation, which is the natural state, it seems, um, when people have to deal with um, awkward situations. <laughs> and even like on a very basic level, former fr fruit picking in Italy and Spain has been r full of terrible situations for workers. Um, and we've seen cooperatives being established and supplying locally um, vegetables. So you've seen a, a across the board response to this um, new um, pandemic situation. We've seen, as Noreen mentioned, that food is crucial and important and central to people's lives now in a way that they might have maybe forgotten about in the past or taken for granted. So we've seen, for example, uh, vegetable box schemes are seeing extraordinary increases in sales. Likewise, seed savers um, are seeing massive increases in sales. Um, and this is just a sign that people are taking um, good, sustainable food, uh, cooking from primary ingredients, um, the basics are important again. One of the things we teach about on the MSC as well is the importance of digital platforms. Um, these were game changers six months ago, but now they're essential and core for local regionalized food systems to function. They're giving an outlet for producers who had suddenly lost all of their sales to restaurants, for example. So these were called disruptive technologies in the past, uh, but now it's more like technology has come to the fore because of disruption. So one of the most prominent ones, which has a strong cork focus is neighbor food. So neighbor food is a digital platform where 50 or so um, producers make their produce available on um, a website. Uh, the consumer picks what they want um, and then it's delivered and picked up in one sort of four hour turnaround. Um, so it's a lot more efficient than a farmer's market in terms of labor costs and time for the producer. And that was all kind of fine as a little add on um, six months ago. Now, when farmers markets have been shut and all kinds of allotments have been shut, all kinds of things have been shut down. And also then producers haven't got their supply chains anymore. All of a sudden, this has become super important as a, as a means to existence for producers, um, as well as being very efficient for the consumer. Um, neighbor food is um, a good Irish one um, and it, the producer gets 80%, um, the host gets 10%, and the neighbor food gets 10%. We're also interested in this more collaborative, cooperative approach as well in our um, MSC. So we've brought in people from the Open Food Network, which is primarily in the UK and Australia and a dozen or so other countries, and starting to come to Ireland now as well with, with some of our help. And this is um, a non-proprietary open source version of um, a digital platform. So there's only a 2% cut 
for the um the the system so to speak um and it's it's owned the, the code is owned by a charity and it's a way for sustainable producers to reach markets in the context i've already described but both have seen huge upswings uh, neighbor individual neighbor foods in cork have seen a quadrupling of shoppers and the open food network similarly has seen a turnover four times higher than their best ever week so uh, Nori mentioned, you know, about two months to embed something new. I think when people get used to these kind of digital platforms, they'll probably keep using them. So the key point really, I suppose, and this is a core element of the MSC that we that we deliver, is that cooperative structures and initiatives give resilience in any context um, and help society cope with unexpected shocks. So they work anyway. So like Mondragon, um, Cleveland, Preston, there's, there's lots of examples of successful co-ops. Um, and cooperative approaches. So co-ops work anyway, but with, what, with what's coming down the line post-COVID in terms of uh, recession, in terms of supply chain needs, uh, the cooperative approach will, we would argue, become absolutely essential. And as well as that, I, I think if you look at the, if you read the tea leaves, so to speak, on what's coming down the line um, from EU agri-food related policy, if you look at the EU Green Deal, the Farm to Fork strategy and the biodiversity strategy, they're all way more ambitious than CAP in terms of the sustainable de development goals and similar initiatives. For example, the um, now it's being released next week, but um, we've seen draft copies and so on, and it looks like they're going to be aiming for 25% uh, organic by 2030 in the um, farm to fork strategy and the biodiversity strategy for the EU. Currently, Ireland's at 2% organic, so that's a massive change, and that's something the cap isn't adapted for yet, but one of the things about EU policy is that year on year, EU policy framework gets written into how the uh, cap will be materializing. So we can see um, with some of these EU policy imperatives, um, significant change coming in terms of sustainability and the cooperative impulse. Noreen? Okay, thanks, Sally. Um, I suppose with all this uh, positive um, developments, I suppose we also need to be um, aware of uh, that another uh, development that is happening in light of COVID-19, I suppose, is the just the upsurge of big uh, data. And I suppose uh, some of the um, reports which critique um, the food system immediately uh, jump on to the opportunities in relation to big data. And then you're back into, um, I suppose, businesses as usual. And I suppose with that, uh, there's a danger that um, we uh, slip into it uh, by default uh, under the umbrella of, um, you know, that it's it's best for health and all of that. So there's some interesting publications there, Professor Harari and others uh, around that that are, are worth um, clicking into and reading. So I suppose, could it be another uh, way? Um, could we... Um, instead of this uh, following technology, could we use technology uh, that is useful? Because there's a lot of good stuff with big data in terms of uh, blockchain and um, what Ollie was talking about there, uh, those online um, uh, platforms. Um, but I suppose the, the key thing uh, to think about is that those things won't happen by default. It needs conscious decisions and, um, and actions. So just around the development of, uh, you know, a regionalized uh, food system. So I suppose uh, just a number of uh, tentative uh, first kind of steps to develop a regionalized uh, food system, but still having, a, a, you know, trade as well. Uh, shifting mindsets and behaviors of key players, that's already happening. Uh, so a building on that. Um, solidarity between consumers and uh, farmers. Uh, but also uh, between consumers themselves and um, between farmers, because there's a lot of times, uh, you know, consumers are pitted against each other or consumers are pitted against farmers. Uh, that say Le Patron in France is really interesting brand, uh, which uh, links consumers and uh, farmers and uh, that kind of building that solidarity between the two. With regard to farmers, a lot of interesting experimentation happening in the farming sector. And on the programme, we um, have taken students out to regenerative uh, agricultural farmers and uh, farmers who are involved in uh, direct selling. Uh, the whole space of territorial co-ops as well, which is uh, based on a, a region, is really interesting development in Europe. Um, I suppose with consumers, it needs to you need to make it easier for consumers to support local and uh, regional. And that is just something that makes sense. In relation to small food companies, um, 
I suppose, you know, they're under pressure as well, like family uh, farming with the globalized system. And, um, you know, there's a tendency maybe to sell out to larger players or, or multinationals, which isn't really of any benefit, I suppose, to uh, local economy or to consumers or to society. And, you know, there's there's opportunities there to develop collaborative models uh, between small uh, food companies where they, uh, you know, benefit uh, from scale but stay independent at the same time. A Clondary community farm model, that's a really interesting model uh, where John McHugh uh, is a farmer and has built production facilities on his farm and invites in local entrepreneurs to make um, ice cream or, or whatever. Um, so that's a really interesting model. And I think it's a model, an innovative model that could be a model for the future. The whole idea of place uh, based development approach as well. I suppose place is something um, that has, uh, you know, uh, I suppose people are reconnecting with place now and seeing maybe the places they live in, uh, maybe again for the first time, uh, really seeing them. And place kind of brings meaning, nature and society together. And those aspects are normally held apart. So it's quite revolutionary. It's a different way of thinking when you think about the development of place rather than an individualized uh, a kind of approach or a collective approach. Um, food policy, uh, Ali mentioned the, the kind of, uh, I suppose, the um, positive things that are happening there but just in terms of getting the incentives uh, right for farmers as well um, and I suppose an important thing to think about in relation to government uh, like a lot of the cooperative activity uh, resulted out of the kind of embedded networks that were there already and I suppose in 2008 uh, there was a lot of centralization uh, you know in the whole austerity program and we need to be uh, careful that there isn't further kind of centralization now in the oncoming uh, recession. And I suppose government a lot of the time just needs to uh, possibly get out of the out of the way. So I suppose cooperation and sustainability are fundamental um, to the transformation of the food system. And I suppose that uh, kind of leads us on to uh, the MSC. And I suppose there's a, a need for, uh, I suppose, thinkers and researchers and uh, practitioners all uh you know thinking about things in a different uh way as was the architects of that better world and we feel that our msc equips um people maybe to be those kind of architects and um, so the key areas uh, on the program are and i won't go through these in detail but agri-food uh, modules around that around economic supply chain uh sustainability uh, cooperation and collaboration, a uh, very important element of the program, transferable skills around project management, professional development, research methods, and a five-month um, placement as well. Um, so I suppose the, the program uh, helps people to develop careers in sustainability, food policy, uh, development, responsible marketing, CSR, uh, compliance officers, um, designers, developers of, of cooperative and collaborative uh, models, uh, bioeconomy, circular economy enablers, and so on and so on. Um, if you want to know more about the MSC, uh, please feel free to get in touch with either myself or Oliver, and there'll be also an opportunity um, to ask questions at the end of this webinar. So thank you very much and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Noreen and Oliver. I'd now like to introduce our next speaker. So we are now going to go to Dr. Ronan O'Farrell. Uh, Ronan is our program director for the MSC in Food Business and Innovation. Good morning, um, everybody. Thank you, Trish, for the introduction. Um, my name is Roman O'Farrell. I'm a lecturer in the Department of Food Business and Development, and I'm also a director of the MSc in Food Business and Innovation program, which is run in the Cork University Business School. Um, it's a relatively new program, which has been running for the past um, two years. So we're just moving into our third cycle um, of that one year program in 2020, 2021. So um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit this morning, um, first and foremost, about the impact of COVID-19 um, on small food producers in Ireland um, and just maybe take you through some of the challenges that have been faced in that sector and um, talk to you a little bit about the relevance of um, our programme and what students learn on that programme which um, can be applied um, in the industry context um, thereafter. So um, 
just maybe to start off, just I suppose looking at the food industry in general in Ireland, um, it's one of the key sectors. It's our largest indigenous sector. It's the largest purchaser of, um, you know, goods and services in the in the Irish economy. The largest indigenous purchaser, um, you know, purchases the vast majority of raw materials which are produced on our farms. Therefore, both directly and indirectly supporting um, farm incomes. Um, albeit uh, maybe not at the levels that we would like to see that and um, you know the incomes that go to farms but um, i guess that's something which is um, evolving um i guess COVID 19 um as a shock um kind of came out of the blue really even though we were tracking it has moved across the world um, and sometimes when you're watching these things you mightn't expect that it's going to come um you know to your own front door um, and um, obviously um, COVID 19 has come to ireland and it has um, had a significant impact on how the market um, has um, worked um, here as a result. Um, the food, um, I suppose the food side of things, people have to continue to eat um, and as far as possible parts of the food market have been kept open um, and obviously other parts of the food um, economy have been shut down, particularly in the hospitality and the food service. And that has had a um, profound um, impact um, on food producers that are dependent or, co or maybe have partial dependent um, on that part of the market for their income. And I'll discuss that with you in a little bit of detail as we progress. So just maybe to look at, um, you know, what, um, you know, um, I suppose what happened in the early days, and um, particularly in the grocery retail side, we saw, you know, a big reaction from customers as the, um, I suppose as the um, the cloud of the pandemic um, moved towards um, our shores, and um, we had people panic buying and stockpiling of food staples, and um, there was a lot of fear among consumers um, over food shortages. Um, you know, particularly looking at some of the staples which we consume, and um, things like pasta, rice, and some of the other um, you know food categories. We don't produce a lot of those in this country. And people were fearful that they were going to run short and um, we've seen long queues in our supermarkets and we've seen empty shelves and um, which is still you know the case across some of the um, the categories um, in the supermarkets and um, a lot of this is driven by uncertainty um, and people still are asking the question you know when is this going to end and we're moving through a phase now where we've got a gradual easing of restrictions but it looks like um, you know the uncertainty is going to be there for some time and people's behavior is going to have to remain adjusted um, you know, um, over a protracted period of time, until such time perhaps as a vaccine um, is widely available. Um, so I guess as the pandemic moved towards Ireland, the economy um, shut down, fear gripped the nation, people didn't really want to go out, they didn't want to interact with other people, um, and this whole, you know, um, you know, social distancing has become the norm, people are working from home, um, and, um, you know, that has had an impact on people's food behaviour, um, particularly, you know, for kind of grab and go convenience type um, food products when people are living at home and um, their food behaviour um, is going to be a little bit um, different. And um, Ali and um, Noreen both alluded to some of the changes which have um, also materialised, you know, with things like neighbour food um, and so on. Um, we've seen um, substantial growth in the online grocery shopping. Um, I think Musgraves just announced this morning that they had added 10 more stores to their online platform due to a growth in demand. Um, in the early days of the um, of the pandemic, people like Tesco um, were just completely inundated. They were one of the only supermarkets that had an online platform which was readily available to consumers. But they were giving delivery dates um, in April for food which was being ordered in March, which seems to be extraordinary. But it just shows the, um, I think there was a large substantial um, volume of demand came at the market. Um, all in one go. So we've seen, you know, um, <clears throat> people moving over to that, um, I suppose, form of behaviour over visiting the stores. Um, and um, I guess all of this is leading to new behaviours around food shopping and that's having an impact on how food producers um, or small food um, businesses um, approach the market. Just to look maybe briefly at the food service um, market, which is distinctly different from the um, retail side, but equally important to um, food producers here in Ireland um, for lots of different products, you know, fresh raw material or fresh foods, things like dairy products and um, fruit and vegetables, meat products, you know, cheeses, a lot of the products that we produce um, directly um, in this country get supplied into the sector. 
Um, consumers spend about 8.55 billion um, on out of food, home and drinks, um, or out of home food and drinks um, every year. So that's a substantial figure, and it's a substantial form of income for the sector, um, and that part of the economy um, has largely been um, shut down um, for the last number of weeks. Um, and it will remain closed unless certain um, criteria um, are met. And as a result, you know, um, cafes and you know, food, I suppose, um, fast food outlets have had to adapt very, very quickly. Practice, um, you know, um, social distancing, um, both in the workplace and also in terms of how they deliver services to their um, to their customers. Um, and it just simply isn't possible to do that in some of the very, very small outlets, um, and they perhaps might struggle to get reopened. So we've had, you know, cafes, hotels, restaurants, canteens, schools, universities, they've all been closed um, and that has suppressed the demand um, for food and had a profound impact on food companies that would be dependent on that sector of the market um, alone. And in addition to that, um, an area that has become increasingly important for food producers to um, engage with customers, show them their products, get them to taste their products, um, you know, um, have been things like festivals, events, public gatherings, and um, sporting events. They've all been cancelled for the foreseeable future. So, you know, festivals such as Bloom, Electric Picnic, you know, they're, you know, they're flower shows, but they've become huge food shows as well. Electric Picnic is a, mu a music show, but it's also become a huge um, food exhibition, you know, the same with the plowing, but they've all been cancelled um, this year. Um, and that has a big impact um, on small food producers um, in our food economy here. Um, and then in addition to that, as Ali mentioned, food markets are also um, closed and that's a primary source of income for a lot of small um, you know, food businesses um, and they've had to you know, rethink how they get their product um, to the market and um, how they can keep their businesses open and you know, things like you know, neighbour food um, have grown enormously um, you know, in popularity um, as, people have had to, as companies have had to migrate from one form of um, marketing um, to another. Um, and I guess the the impact of COVID isn't you know limited to the Irish market. We've also had um, you know closures um, across um, a lot of our main export markets in the food service and both. And you know um, that has had an impact on our beef industry, our dairy industry, um, and our consumer foods industry. That will be large suppliers into those um, sectors um, in the UK, particularly, and then across um, into um, Europe um, as well. So, um, you know, while, you know, the supermarkets look busy and the queues are there and, you know, people have this idea that, you know, food companies must be very, very busy and um, even the busy ones um, have been impacted greatly, you know, somewhere between 40 and 50 percent in terms of revenue and, um, you know, in terms of job losses. And um, so they've, you know, they felt the pain and, um, you know, pretty much the same as um, everybody else. Um, so some of the key issues that um, are being um, faced by food SMEs as a result um, of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, you know, we've had suppressed demand, um, you know, both in domestic and export markets and um, in a food system, um, you know, where you've got farmers producing food, it's very difficult to stop crops growing, it's very you know, difficult to stop the production of dairy products animals don't stop growing, you can't stop feeding them. Um, and that makes it um, even more difficult, um, you know, when markets shut down um, for protracted periods of time, um, you know, because you get a build up um, of all of this product in the background. Um, and, um, you know, that's going to make it challenging in terms of maybe pricing going forward um, and also how that um, stock gets used up um, over time. And um, business have had, um, you know, substantial issues in terms of cash flow and um, particularly small businesses that don't have access maybe to some of the um you know the week-to-week -week, um sales opportunities that they would have had in the past and um, also getting access to and um, credit a lot of the big wholesalers um, and distributors have cut their credit lines to small food producers and um, because they see them as being and um, you know presenting a higher risk and um, and that makes it difficult for them to um, to operate and um, we've had some um, issues around raw material availability um, and we've seen some product shortages again um, in some of our supermarkets for brands that are imported um, into this country. And then there's things that are food related, but you know, not specifically food related, things like equipment and processing technology. 
um, parts and services, for example, breakdowns haven't been dealt with, um, you know, um, installations haven't been dealt with. A lot of the equipment that we use in the food industry comes from the UK, the Netherlands, Germany, and um, parts of Italy. And due to travel restrictions, um, you know, equipment has arrived, parts have arrived, but the service personnel who would be charged with, um, you know, installation and servicing haven't been able to travel. And um, that's an issue that's out there at the moment. Um, Obviously, um, with the new government guidelines, which have been announced for getting people um, back into the workplace, the food industry is considered, considered essential, um, but they will also have to observe um, you know, the new health and safety um, and compliance, um, I suppose, um, compliance um, guidelines that have been issued by the government and um, you know, workplace social distancing um, is going to be difficult in some areas of the food industry where there's a lot of manual handling, there's a lot of, you know, in places like packing areas, in dispatch, and, um, you know, it's going to be um, difficult to um, to observe um, all of the, um, the guidelines. And then you've got the cost of retrofitting, perhaps, to um, get to a level of compliance that fulfills our obligations under health and safety and protects the safety of our staff and customers and so on and so forth. Um, delivery and service levels have obviously been impacted as well. Um, you know, um, it just has been um, a little bit more difficult to get um, product to market. Um, you know, there were peak demands, um, you know, in the supermarkets from time to time, and smaller food companies would struggle to, um, you know, to um, to meet that um, requirement all the time. Um, and then, I guess, on top of dealing with all of the issues that are there in the marketplace, you know, changes in consumer behaviour, how and um, when and where they're going to be shopping now and where they're going to be shopping in the future. And um, these are all issues that um, customers need to be, or the food producers need to be thinking about. Um, access to labor, um, again, you know, bringing people back to work, um, how that's going to work um, is going to be um, an issue again that is going to be there for, um, for the smaller food companies. And then I guess when this pandemic um, passes, we've got um, breaks it on the horizon um, and that's just going to increase um, the challenges again. Um, I'd have to say that a lot of food producers have you know, spent the last couple of years preparing themselves for Brexit and I think that has increased their resilience um, during this um, you know, pandemic. And as Ali mentioned there, you know, that um, you know, cooperation, it works, um, and a lot of food producers would work closely together, work together in distribution, work together in, um, you know, in marketing, um, and, um, you know, they're coming up with solutions for the last couple of years for Brexit, and that has really helped them to be um, resilient um, in um, the last number of weeks. Um, I guess when the last recession um, started, maybe perhaps in, you know, as early as 2008, um, you know, we look to the food industry to create employment, to get our exports back up and running, um, you know, to, um, and I, I think we're going to find that the food industry is going to be a shining light over the next number of years as our economy recovers from the impact um, of COVID-19. Um, just to, um, I suppose, just some of the things that might be coming down um, the track, um, you know, for our companies, um, I suppose you know we're going to have continued social distancing measures dominating consumer behavior and um, how people shop when they shop where they shop and um, we're going to see increased um, shopping um, online Mintel just published a report um, in April 2020 which is seen right across Europe in all developed um, markets big increase in online shopping and um, increase in contactless payments you know a lot of people are getting food delivered to their um, to their home in order to do that you have to be able to do the contactless payment so you know these technologies um are being and um, being used contactless food delivery systems so people are using different platforms to um order their food products and um, you know and if you were around the city here during the lockdown and um, you know some of the only people that were on the streets were people like Deliveroo, Just Eat um, and you know it was easier to see the you know the volume of um, that type of activity that's going on when there's nothing else um, happening and it was quite extensive. Um, but I think um, there's still a lot of uncertainty around how the food service and hospitality markets will um, reopen and when life will go back to normal and this is a significant part of our food um, market um, and um, We'd like to see that returning as soon as possible, obviously. 
So for food SMEs, they're going to be faced with a new reality. Um, and I guess what companies are trying to figure out is, you know, what are the levels of demand, excuse me, going to be and what are the consumption patterns and trends that are going to prevail um, going forward um, and how that's going to um, impact on their current strategy and future strategy um, and how they can develop strategies um, that um, allow them to respond um, to those um, changes that are um, in our market at the moment. Um, so I think, you know, companies, you know, speaking to a number of, um, you know, food producers over the last number of um, weeks as this um, pandemic has dominated, um, I suppose, the activity in the economy, um, you know, companies are talking about innovation, product and service development, um, you know, being entrepreneurial and how they're approaching things. So trying to find solutions for, um, you know, their customers where they can add value. Um, and just a very, very simple one um, on the bakery side of things. Um, people had stopped buying scones, croissants, um, you know, where they were available, um, you know, loose and um, unpacked um, in shops, um, which was a big selling point because it looks like it's, you know, freshly baked in store. Um, food companies have now had to come up with uh, means of packing all of those products and delivering them so that the customer will um, pick them up with confidence and not fear that um, the product has been handled by another customer that potentially might have been sick or whatever like that. So um, the food industry is very, um, you know, is very um, good at adapting and reacting to, um, to these changes. So I think innovation is going to be a key um, strategy. And again, you know, that whole um, spirit of entrepreneurship and trying to um, to do things a little bit differently, come up with new ideas and, and bring those to the market. And um, I think companies are going to review, um, you know, their marketing um, strategies, particularly those that would have been severely impacted by the close, closure in the food service. And, you know, it's probably not a good idea to be over dependent on one sector of um, the market than another. And I think people will look at how they, um, they balance that up um, in the future. I've seen a new phrase coming out, and again, Noreen and um, Oliver would have um, referred to it, this hyper, the idea of hyper, hyper local um, and the way supermarkets um, have reverted to local um, secure um, food supply chains um, and also, you know, things like neighbour food, where people have been able to access um, the produce of local food producers um, through these um, networks. So um, that's um, you know, been a very, very positive development for small food. And businesses so you know new innovative routes to market and um, so neighbor the neighbor food platform would be one that has worked seems to have worked really really well and we've also seen um you know small food producers going online and developing new apps in fact we have um, eight of our students who um were on the program last year whether they're, they're on the program this year that finished up and um, the thought part of the program in semester two and um, basically um, put out a tweet and um, looking to utilize some of the skills which they would have picked up on the course during the year, particularly around digital, um, you know, digital platform development and um, maybe understanding that it's an area that um, food companies might have been um, weak in and as um, this pandemic um, took hold and markets were closing down and, um, you know, companies needed to figure out how they could communicate and get product to customers quickly. So one of the girls in the class um, put a tweet out, she put, um, you know, resourced um, behind with a number of her students that were willing to participate if the demand was, um, you know, at any level. Um, and eight of the students have been working directly free of charge with companies developing their social media platforms, helping them to um, look at things like um, Shopify, where they can get the products online um, and so on and so forth. So that's been really um, interesting to see um, our students um, doing that. Um, and it's, I, I guess, very, very pleasing to think that we've given them the skill set and the confidence on the programme um, in order to take those um, opportunities up. Um, again, in, import substitution, I think, is something that's going to be important perhaps in the next 12 months we import about 3.5 billion alone from the uk and um, you know as just as recently as 2019 and a lot of that comes in the form of dairy products meats and things like that um, and i think there's opportunity there to substitute and um, some part of that and um, you know from our local production base 
Um, again, things that we're seeing, um, you know, happening on the ground, um, and food companies are going to have to, you know, adopt. And um, this, we're seeing food service adapting to a more retail and um, delicatessen type um, structure, because um, for for them, social distancing means that they can, you know, have less covers in the restaurant, so they have to look at how they can um, adapt and um, to keep um, their covers up, keep the income and um, levels at um, a sustainable level. Um, and serve as many customers as they can. And that's going to um, present challenges for, you know, for food producers in terms of how they supply that market going forward. Um, and I think overall, there's been an increased requirement for digital and online marketing expertise to promote, to promote new products, excuse me, and engage with customers. Um, you know, food producers can't go into stores at the moment, they can't do tastings, they can't go to farmers markets. And that's a key part of um, getting people to try our food, get, getting them to taste it, like it and buy it. Um, and those opportunities have been taken away. So, you know, we're looking at how this can be done digitally and, um, you know, engage with customers in that respect. I think, again, obviously, with any um, health-related, um, I suppose, shock in the market, things like health and food um, become very important. And I think, again, previous speakers alluded to the fact that purchasing your food um, locally and um, that's well-produced, really good quality, um, enhances that for people who've got you know, people growing more food at home. I think Oliver mentioned, you know, the seed companies had um, run short recently, which is, you know, obviously, um, it's nice to see, again, people having that connection um, with food. And I think a critical part of the recovery for um, food SMEs will be the government sports. Um, and I don't think they've been found wanting in that department um, up to now. Just to speak very briefly on the programme, um, I guess we concentrate a lot on the commercial side of the food industry, which is looking at food processors, the retail market, food service, supply chains, um, and some of the key skill sets that we um, deliver to the student center in the areas of innovation, entrepreneurship, strategic marketing, um, retail marketing management, um, um, supply chain management, um, research methods, students go on um, five-month placement as they do with the other programs um, in industry um, and um, obviously digital marketing is a key um, feature of the program as well. So um, like my colleagues, um, I'm going to stay online there for a few minutes at the end to answer any questions that you might have. Um, all the details of the program are available on the CUBS website and um, we would be delighted to hear from anybody who's interested in um, applying for that. So thank you very much. I'll hand it back to Trish. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Ronan. Um, I can see we have a lot of questions coming in. We are just going to go back to Nick first. And after Nick's presentation, um, we're going to answer as many questions as we can. And then afterwards, we'll also be on and answering questions as well. So welcome back, Nick. Nick is our director of the MSB in Food Security Policy and Management. So Nick, would you go ahead with your presentation there? Great, thanks, Trish, and apologies for the um, the the, um, the problem, the uh, technical problem that we had at the start. Um, so I'm going to go fairly quickly now through um, the impacts of COVID-19 in developing countries, which, as I said, is the main focus of my presentation. Um, I think the, the the point is that the impacts on um, developing countries could be enormous um, at the moment. Most developing countries are at the kind of earlier stages of the pandemic um, compared with Europe and Asia. And um, actually the number of cases and the number of deaths, thankfully at the moment are relatively low in developing countries, but um, there is a possibility that the pandemic could spread very rapidly and widely in developing countries. And if so, um, the impacts could be pretty uh, devastating. So there are some estimates, for example, by the World Food Programme um, that says that could be more than 250 million people suffering acute hunger by the end of the year um, as a result of the pandemic if no action is taken. Now, um, countries in Africa are um, taking action. They're doing uh, lockdowns and other sorts of activities as well. Um, so we don't know what the impacts are going to be, but there's a potential for really substantial impacts, um, particularly in African countries and also in countries where there are major conflicts going on such as in Yemen and uh, Syria and so on. Um, what we note in developing countries as well as uh, here actually is that the impacts are um, differentiated. You know, not everybody is affected to the same extent. So um, certainly in developing countries, there are 
um, likely to be, and already are to some extent, severe impacts on the urban poor um, who depend on markets for food and also particularly on um, people, and there are very large numbers of them, um, who live in urban slums in developing countries because, um, first of all, they also depend on markets for food, um, they have low incomes, and also then uh, because of crowded conditions and so on, they have greater exposure to, to the virus. Um, what we see already in a lot of African countries is that agricultural production and markets are being disrupted because they are, um, you know, to some extent following the same sorts of policies of lockdowns and restriction of movement and social distancing and things like that. So that means that um, uh, agricultural inputs are less available, labor is less available, and um, uh, food markets are not functioning uh, as they were before. Also then, um, consumers in developing countries tend to have less access to nutritious food um, because their incomes have gone down. Um, they're losing livelihoods, as many people have in Ireland, of course, um, and with less income, uh, consumers in developing countries tend to switch their consumption from, um, you know, relatively more nutritious foods like fruit and vegetables, dairy produce, and so on, back to kind of staples like rice and, and, and wheat and so on. So this has a negative impact on, on nutrition. And then, of course, um, I suppose one of the main considerations is that governments in developing countries have less resources to support households um, during lockdowns. And in, in Ireland, of course, we have the you know, the COVID-19, uh, the pandemic emergency payments and such like. Um, governments in poor countries have um, far fewer resources to be able to support um, people um, when they're not able to work or gain a livelihood. Um, and I suppose uh, another question then in regard to developing countries is that um, COVID-19 is just adding to um, a situation of widespread chronic uh, hunger um, it's estimated, and, and the Global Nutrition Report of 2020 was um, uh, published yesterday, actually, and they say that there are more than 820 million people in chronic hunger. Here we're talking about an extra, you know, 250 million or so um, being pushed into acute hunger with uh, COVID-19. But there's a, there's a major problem of chronic long-term food insecurity um, in developing countries. Um, there are major problems of very high rates of malnutrition, um, and these days when we talk about malnutrition, you know, we're talking about both undernutrition and overnutrition. Um, so undernutrition is a major problem in, in the lowest income developing countries, but um, overnutrition is, is also a problem. And, and, and both of those characteristics um, make people more susceptible to um, COVID-19. So we have a system, uh, situation of food systems already being fragile even before COVID-19 um, hit. Currently, um, globally, there's estimated to be about 1.6 billion children um, out of school um, globally due to lockdowns. That includes uh, in Europe and in Ireland. Um, and um, almost 370 million children missing school meals. So school meals are um, you know, a, a major support to children in low-income countries, and, and they encourage children to, to go to school and stay in school, actually. Um, so with schools being closed, um, a large number of children in developing countries are also missing out on those school meals. Um, how do governments respond? Um, often in these kind of crises, governments respond by um, imposing export restrictions, and you can see in the, um, the graph there, that so far it's estimated that um, 16 countries have imposed um, food export restrictions of one sort or another. Um, generally, what that does then is restrict the availability of food on world markets, and as a result of that, prices tend to go up. So actually, um, most international agencies would discourage these kind of export restrictions, but obviously individual countries would tend to do them to make sure they have enough food in, the, in, um, in their own country. Um, during the last major crisis in 2008, as well as it being a financial crisis, there was also a food price crisis, and we saw um, in that situation 33 countries imposed food export restrictions, and that contributed to massive increases in food prices on world markets. Um, we also then, because of market disruptions, because uh, people can't take food to market, um, particularly perishable foods, we're likely to, to see um, a lot of food waste and a lot of food losses.
Um, taking Ethiopia as an example, um, uh, I do quite a lot of work in Ethiopia. We have projects going on there, and um, a lot of that is around um, trying to improve nutrition security in Ethiopia. Um, so Ethiopia um, has responded to COVID-19. They introduced a rapid lockdown. Um, and that, of course, has, just as it has here, reduced mobility and access to markets. Um, so there's been some kind of initial studies on the impacts of lockdown on the consumption of nutritious foods in, in a situation where there's already high levels of um, food insecurity and undernutrition. So what seems to be happening so far is that um, vegetable trade and consumption is reducing. It's also the case then that with, re with reduced consumption, um, producer prices are falling. Um, you're seeing increased food losses and, and the picture there, um, you can see tomatoes that have just been sort of left um, to rot in the, in, in the field because um, they can't be moved to market. Um, we're finding also um, shortages of agricultural inputs and therefore um, the prices of agricultural inputs have increased and also labor shortages. And I suppose in, in these countries, as well as the immediate impact um, of these kind of um, losses and these kind of shocks, um, if farmers can't plant and if they can't get the inputs for their um, harvest in future, then um, there's going to be major impacts, uh, you know, a few months down the line. And that's one of the reasons why some of these estimates are talking about um, large numbers of people suffering acute hunger um, towards the end of the year. Um, so what are some of the responses? I mean, there's, there's, there's um, been a lot of work done by international agencies on um, the short, the immediate impacts of COVID-19 for food security and nutrition, and also then coming up with some responses. So um, I suppose what's vital in developing countries is to be able to continue smallholder production. Um, in most developing countries, smallholders are, are the backbone of agriculture. Um, they produce most of the food, and also, of course, um, agriculture is fundamental for their livelihoods. So there need to be ways of um, somehow continuing smallholder production, even during lockdowns, even during uh, market disruptions and uh, increased input price and so on. Um, and some of this um, can actually rely on uh, improved technology, as, as um, some of the other speakers have talked about, um, the use of smartphones, which, which actually has expanded massively in developing countries, um, transfer, digital transfers of money um, to, to provide credit to, to farmers, um, and, and basically, there are ways of innovating to try to um, uh, support smallholders to continue production. Um, there's also then um, the need to, um, I suppose, expand supply chain, shorter supply chains, linking producers to domestic markets. And again, um, Noreen and Ollie and, and uh, Ronan as well have talked about the potential role of cooperatives. Um, cooperatives uh, can play a major role in um, moving produce from farmers to domestic markets in a safe way that uh, that you know restricts um, uh, social interaction or physical interaction, if you like. Um, there's a need for governments to use strategic food reserves, um, which uh, many developing country governments have, to limit price increases. Uh, I mean, as food is short in on food markets, then we expect prices to increase, but. Uh, if governments can use strategic food reserves to put food onto the market, that can limit some of these price increases. And then there's um, a need to maintain income through major social protection programs. I mean, again, we can see in Ireland that's what's being done here. It's what's being done across Europe um, to maintain incomes as, as people haven't been able to go to work. Um, and really the same needs to be done in developing countries. But the issue is that developing countries, by their nature, don't have the same level of resources to be able to um, provide major social protection, um, but it's essential. So that means um, a, a significant role for international agencies, for um, developed country governments, including the Irish government, to, to through um, you know, development assistance programs, help to fund um, social protection programs that will protect people's livelihoods. And within that, um, it's important to protect nutrition. Uh, as I mentioned, what tends to happen in developing countries is that when um, prices go up, um, consumers tend to switch their consumption from more nutritious um, uh, foods to uh, staple foods, grains, uh, essentially. Um, and that can have negative uh, consequences for nutrition. So 
Um, social protection programs can also provide uh, nutritious foods, not just um, uh, staple grains, and, and in that way protect nutrition of vulnerable households. So I suppose that that's just um, a very sort of brief um, summary of some of the initial uh, impacts of COVID-19 in developing countries in, in, in terms of food security and um, a few proposals in terms of um, how to respond to that. As, as I said, um, so far in African countries, the impact of COVID-19 hasn't been so great, but the fear is that um, it might um, take on and uh, spread widely. And if that's the case in a situation where countries have limited resources and um, limited health systems, um, it could the impact could be quite devastating. So I suppose just very, very briefly to say about the program, the MSC Food Security Policy and Management, um, it really has four broad areas of focus, um, which you can see on the screen there. Um, food security policy, um, program planning and management, a focus on sustainable food systems, and a focus on improved nutrition and dietary quality. So COVID-19 is a very immediate issue um, where all those areas of activity are needed. But um, as I mentioned, you know, there are there are kind of longer term issues around food security, there's longer term issues around um, malnutrition, there's obviously um, the impacts of climate change on the food system. So very, very important to um, have people who are, understand um, these kind of issues and also can develop the skill set to design policies and to um, design programs which can address some of these um, major issues around food security and malnutrition. Um, and I should also then mention um, that, as, as others have mentioned, that um, in terms of the structure of the program, um, there is a major applied research project, and that, uh, that goes on for, for five months. Um, that gives people the opportunity to work on um, real life food security and nutrition issues. Um, this year we have a number of, although the, the research project has been somewhat affected by COVID-19 as well, but um, we have students um, working with Irish NGOs and also linked with institutes like the Ethiopian Public Health Institute, um, working on, on really interesting uh, aspects of applied research to address food security and nutrition issues. And um, finally, I should mention that we also have a link up with the International Food Policy Research Institute, which is a um, a world-renowned um, uh, research institute based in Washington, D.C., um, and they collaborate with us in, in the delivery of the program. And um, uh, also, although we in the Department of Food Business and Development lead this program, um, but we also collaborate with the School of Public Health and also with BIS in its delivery. So um, that's, uh, I think, um, uh, a summary of the program, and uh, now I'll hand you back to Trish. Great, thank you very much for that, Nick. Um, I am going to give a brief overview of the application process. Before I do that, um, we have quite a lot of questions come in. So we are going to answer some of these questions now for you before I go through the application process, how to apply, and if you've applied already, what happens next. So um, we look at maybe the first question here. Um, one of the questions that has come in is, what exactly causes the shortage of food in retail stores? Is the limitation in transport of food items from farms to the retail stores or the camouflage and surge in online buying? So, Roland, do you want to give us an answer that one? Yeah, I think there's probably no one single um, answer that would, um, I suppose, be the main cause for that. Um, I guess in the early days, um, there was just, I guess, the the peak in demand when there was panic buying in the supermarkets um, and simply and um, there just wasn't enough stock um, in the background to satisfy everybody's requirements all at once um, and you know I, I can certainly remember items like pasta rice you know those kind of long shelf life staple products and um, were in very very high demand and um, we can all remember things like toilet paper and so on and you know just you know just going short um, it's not that the companies weren't producing it, and um, it's just simply that the supply chains hadn't um, maybe anticipated, you know, those peak demand, um, I suppose, incidents, um, you know, when they arrived. And the problem was, or one of the issues was that um, these peak demands were um, happening 
all across different markets. It wasn't just isolated to one market, which could be responded to quickly. This was happening right across the board, right across Europe and um, into Asia where you had spikes in demand. Um, the second issue that leads to shortages is perhaps, um, you know, there's been disruption in packaging supply chains, raw material supply chains. Um, and, you know, that has prevented companies from maybe getting pro their, their raw materials as quickly as they would like to keep the market supplied. But I think in all cases, you know, companies would like to stay producing product, would like to continue producing product um, and selling product, um, you know, where possible in the retail side. But, you know, there are issues like that. Um, again, companies have been affected where they haven't been able to operate or practice safe social distancing in the workplace and their productivity has been reduced as a consequence of that. I've seen that in a couple of situations, which has been challenging for the companies. Um, and then I've seen one or two situations where companies would have been maybe overly dependent on the food service market. And when that shut down, they found themselves in a situation where they had to close down because it simply would just be costing too much money to operate the retail side of their business or supply the retail market if they wouldn't have had enough business. So there could be any number of factors that would um, contribute um, to those shortages. But generally, it came back to those peak demands where... Um, it was just unprecedented and it happened across so many different markets um, and the natural tendency um, you know like a lot of the products that we see on our supermarket shelves here in Ireland for example come in from Europe but they come in through the UK so the UK was experiencing that peak demand at the same time as us so wholesalers in the UK would just simply say well we we'll keep it for our local market we we'll give it to the supermarkets that we deal with here um, and less would come into the Irish market, and as a result, then you'd have some shortages. But that, you know, that 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 has even developed very, very quickly um, over the last number of weeks. From my own observations, um, it doesn't seem to be an issue at the moment. Okay, perfect. Just leading on from that, Ron, and we had a question come in about our incoming students. So, how yeah. would uh, COVID nineteen impact their job prospects and the internship aspect of the program? Um, so, in actual fact, um, I guess again like that now in the early early days in March, and um, when um, you know when you had all of that uncertainty, and you know across the university we had, um, you know, had to take, make decisions in relation to placements. Um, I think on the out of the out of of the the students that around the program this year, about thirty percent of them have secured full time employment um, at this time. Um, and they're doing their research um, on the site. So their placements would have perhaps not materialized as they would have liked because remote working wasn't a possibility. Um, but even as late as yesterday, we had a student who has just secured a job. We've had students getting jobs in Pepsi recently and um, going into Musgraves. And um, I, I suppose the demand for food remains, you know, you know, relatively um, stable. There's been a big obviously a big increase on the retail side because the food service has um, reduced. But all of those sectors will have to come back, um, you know, um, later on this year and into next year. Um, I think there's going to be a big um, push to, um, you know, on the food sector to you know, be one of the leading lights in the recovery in the economy, and um, particularly in export markets. Um, and I think that um, always, you know, drives employment, particularly, um, you know, during the last 10 years, the, the employment has been very stable. The opportunities have, you know, just continued continued to um, come through year after year across the, the food um you know the food um i suppose the food um, sector um and um yeah it's just i suppose it's a critical sector here in ireland but it's critical um you know sector for everybody else we have to eat in order to survive so um you know um and you just i suppose there's from what I can see, there seems to be opportunities there all the time, you know. So I think students that are coming in, um, it's obviously going to be a more challenging environment overall. Um, but I'd be, you know, I'd be very confident that um, the companies that we've worked with in the past will continue to be recruiting um, our graduates. I think the skill set acquisition that um, you get in any master's program, I think, you know, across all of these programs where you've got the professional development, um, side of things and then you know specific modules that and um, focus on you know certain areas and students come out very very well prepared they perform well in their interviews um, and seem to go on and do very well in the industry afterwards um, and um, i guess that's very satisfying for us in the department 
and um, you know when we see our students uh, progressing across the big agri businesses the big food businesses the smaller indigenous businesses here in ireland and also you know with some of the bigger global players as well with our students have done extremely well over the years so we've really good quality programs really good quality students going into those programs and we're well known for that and um, and um you know companies come to us looking for those students as a result so i think that's i don't i can't see that changing dramatically it mightn't be as strong as other years but you know that that remains to be seen you know okay brilliant thank you um i'm going to bring um oliver in now sarah fitzgerald had a question asking um local supply local chains are doing well how is an irish industry which is so focused on experts exports going to adapt yeah, I mean, this is a bit of a conundrum, all right, in, in Ireland, because we are very dependent on exports, especially in um, beef and dairy. We could actually, you know, increase our, our local production of horticulture. Um, and JOCA, actually, the Joint Directors Committee on Climate Action, did recommend more diversification in the Irish agri-food sector because of the coming, you know, crises. They hadn't predicted COVID, but they certainly we're thinking in climate change terms, it would help with our resilience. Um, but yeah, so what's happening in terms of helping right now in agri-food terms, at the EU level, um, they've brought in preferential treatments of agri-food travel, so, so to speak. So the movement of agri-food products around the EU has been given what's called green line access. So you can move food around faster. The EU has also brought back in intervention uh, which isn't ideal, but uh, some some dairy um, co-ops in Europe are recommending a reduction in volume um, as well as so to, to keep the price up, but um, others recommend um, keep the volume high and bring back storage, which is intervention. Um, so there's a debate on about that at the moment, but bear in mind, I suppose the EU has a 100 billion euro trade surplus anyway in agri-food, so there's a certain resilience there, but I guess the new green deal that's coming through the EU does build in some of those more um, resiliences. If we do start to increase our, um, you know, percentages of organic production, for example, we'll see a greater local resilience because organic is more labor intensive, um, uses more local resources and so on. Um, but yeah, we can only probably localize about one third of our food consumption. I mean, if you think about cereal crops and so on, a lot of that's produced in Ukraine, um, and it's a durable product that, that moves. So there'll still be a certain amount of um, global trade. But even, for example, I was on Countrywide last month on the, on the RT radio talking about um, fair trade. And the person on before me was the board B main buyer for China. So China is still bringing in European food because of swine flu, for example, it wants more Irish beef. So there are these kind of crises that do define how agri-food operates. But we have to build in as much resilience and robustness as possible because it's not just that there's one crisis now that there's multiple ones. But there are certainly at EU level, um, there are initiatives to keep things moving for now. But I think we should take this opportunity to build more resilience and more diversification into Irish agri-food. And that's part of what we um, try and talk to people about on the course and part of what we try and train people up for as well. So, Great. Thank you for that, Oliver. We've quite an amount of questions so we're just going to um, maybe take one or two more and we'll answer any other questions um, through YouTube afterwards. So we might just bring Nick back in here. We had a question in the midst of lockdown and pandemic there may be a huge rise in the rate of malnutrition. How do we ensure the hard to reach populations are food secured? Okay um, yeah, the, the, there may well be a risk, and, and I quoted some of the some of the figures on that. Um, I think in the short term, um, social protection programs are really important. I mean, these are quite widespread now in developing countries, um, and they can be um, expanded or reduced depending on on current on the uh, circumstances. So, um, when I say social protection programs, I mean that includes um, you know cash transfers, um, like social assistance sorts of transfers. It can include um, food assistance. It can include school feeding programs uh, and uh, supplementary feeding for children, and so on. So there's kind of diverse programs like that, um, which you know can respond and, and increase in in the short term. Uh, now, obviously, they have to be resourced, and uh, that's one of the one of the issues in developing countries. Some some countries, say like South Africa, now have 
you know, good resources that they support their own social protection programs, but other countries like Ethiopia and Malawi, they need a lot of support from the developed world. And I think, um, you know, this is one of the aspects of global solidarity, really, that, um, of course, we're very much concerned about COVID-19 in Ireland, but we have to also see the bigger picture and, and uh, provide um, support on a, on a global basis. But, um, I mean, I think in the longer term, um, as Oli just said, um, in developing countries as well, there's a need for um, more resilient and diversified food systems. Um, and um, people do talk about, you know, one of the problems of malnutrition in the, in the long term is the lack of access to nutritious food, such as food, uh, fruit and vegetables, um, pulses, animal source foods, and so on. Um, and I, I think a lot of developing countries just tend to focus on um, producing staple crops because that's what people need for their immediate energy needs. But um, there's a need to um, improve food systems and, and support diversification of agricultural systems in developing countries and also um, boost productivity such that um, these more diverse foods are available and are affordable because that's one of the big issues in developing countries that you know when, when these kind of nutritious foods are being produced they're um, out of reach from uh, an affordability point of view for um, vulnerable households. And I think the, the other thing to mention in the short term is, um, as I did mention already, I suppose, just the need to somehow um, maintain production through to the next harvest in, in, in the short term, because um, in developing countries, often there's only one main harvest, and if that is somehow missed, then the impacts are gonna be, are gonna be really serious. So, um, innovative ways to support farmers um, to make sure that inputs are, pro are provided uh, and so on are, are really important. Great, thank you for that, Nick. Um, we just had a question in there from Nicola. She was asking about the entry requirements for the programs. So before I just give you an overview of the application form and how to apply for our three programs, I just uh, respond there to Nicola. So all of our three programs have an entry requirement of a second class honours grade two. So that is, if you're looking at the GPA perspective, it's three out of four or 3.75 out of five and a percentage wise, it's 50 to 59%. Um, so it's the second class honours grade two in an undergraduate degree level eight. So it's normally a university degree, either a three or four year degree. But we also look at people who may not have that two two entry requirement, but would have a lot of professional experience as well. Um, so there are quite a few questions still coming in. So we will answer them after the webinar has finished. But just for the next kind of three to four minutes, I'm going to go through the application side. So if you're interested in applying for the, either of these three programs, or if you've applied already, I'll give you some information on this. So what will you need to actually make an application? So first of all, all our applications are online at www.pac.ie forward slash UCC. You will need um, a PPS number if you're applying from within Ireland. If you're applying from outside of Ireland, you won't need that. If you're a UCC student, you need your UCC number. Again, if you're applying from outside of UCC, you can easily just upload transcripts of your results. Uh, credit card details. So our application fee is 50 euros and you actually get to apply for three different programs with that. It's not 50 euros per program. Um, you also need an active email account that you check regularly. It's really important to put in your correct email address here as each program or each um, program will either offer you or give you conditional offers or look for updated details. So all that correspondence will actually come through your email account. So if you are getting an offer or a conditional offer, so say you are in your final year in your degree, you could get a conditional offer based on you getting a second class honours grade two in your final degree result. You have 14 days then to either accept or decline that offer. But as I said, you can apply for up to three top programmes on your application form. So you could apply for the MSc in food security and policy management, and you could put down the MSc in Cooperatives, Agri-Food and Sustainable Development. And you could also put down the MSc in Food Business and Innovation. 
And what happens then, it's not a preference-based system like our CAO here in Ireland. Each program and each application will go to the program director to assess and make a decision on. So you could actually get either three full offers or three conditional offers for each of those programs, but you can only accept one at any one time. So you have to make a decision then on what program you actually want. It's not necessary to compete all program choices. So if you're 100% sure that you want to apply, for example, the MSc in Food Business and Innovation, all you have to do is put down that program and it's still just 50 euros to apply for that. Um, you would normally get an answer fairly quickly on your application. Um, usually within a week at the most, you know whether you have been accepted onto the program, either a full offer or a conditional offer. Hopefully you won't have any rejections on your application. Um, I also offer one-to-one -one online sessions. So before COVID-19, I used to be sitting down with students in a room where we would look at all their options in the Cork University Business School. Now that has been obviously put to an online sessions, either through Zoom or Skype, where we'll sit down, we look at your strengths, look at your areas of passion, look at the areas that we offer here in Cubs, and we look at each of the entry requirements. And normally after the space of maybe 30 minutes to an hour, we've narrowed it down to three different options. Now those online sessions are completely free and they're available for EU and non-EU students at a time that's actually um, suitable and available to yourselves. Um, so that's a very quick overview of the application process. What I would say to you, if you haven't applied online or yet, it's a very quick application process. You normally go through the application in maybe 15, 20 minutes max. Most of our programs in Cubs don't actually need um, a personal statement. We just look at your degree results to see whether you'd be eligible for an application or not. The only exception there to that is if you don't have what I mentioned earlier, a second class honor is grade two degree already. We then look at your professional experience and a personal statement. So that was kind of a brief overview of the application site. I my email address is there if you have any follow up questions on the application side or if you want to arrange a one to one online session, I'd be very happy to facilitate that for you as well. Um, so just to kind of finish off the webinar, I'd like to thank everybody who participated today and who asked a lot of questions. The three program directors and myself will be online on the YouTube link afterwards answering any of your questions. We will be around for a little while. I'd like to thank our three presenters this afternoon. So I'd like to thank Dr. Nick Chisholm, Dr. Noreen Byrne and Dr. Oliver Morris, sorry, our four presenters, and Dr. Ronan O'Farrell. I'd also like to thank the Cubs media team who were instrumental in setting this up and providing all the tech supports. So our next webinar series will be taking place on the 20th of May, and that will be around creating digital services that people need and want. So again, thank you to all our participants and we'll hopefully see you next week at the 20th of May at 12. Thank you.